Hey guys, welcome. Uh, welcome to Couple of Fern. My name is Mark Catelli. I have uh, three doctors here with me today. Uh, Dr. Matt Callahan, Dr. Bruce Snyder, and Dr. Sam James. They'll be talking about native earthworms. Um, here at Couple of Fern, we're in Florida, but they are in Georgia and uh, Iowa and different places. So please uh, give them a warm welcome. Uh, I'm going to go through my uh, announcements really quickly and then hand it over to them and they can introduce themselves to you and uh, we can get the uh, Native mm -hmm. Farm presentation started. Welcome to Couple of Farm, Florida Native Plant Society. Our mission is always the conservation, preservation and restoration of Florida Native plants and Native plant communities. So this video will be available on our YouTube channel. So I have it right here. This is our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash couple of fern. Uh, lots of videos right here. And the native earthworms video will also be present here. So go ahead and click subscribe if you haven't already, in case you would like to review this video at a later time. Uh, members, I'll be posting <laughs> the, um, in the chat box uh, a link to report your volunteer hours uh, most of you guys already have the link but for newcomers in case you are volunteering uh, at the plant sale or for other uh, outreaches that we're doing you can report them in the link provided to you uh, our upcoming events and outreaches are here spring is a very busy time for us uh, right now it's so hot that we can also already classify it as being summer uh, the uh, first one that we have is on Saturday, March 13th. This is this Saturday at 3 p.m. with Jennifer Hopton Villalobos. She'll be talking about new natives in the garden. And this is learning through experience. So Jennifer is a bona fide plant hoarder. Uh, she has pretty much one species of everything. And she loves to experiment with uh, new additions. Uh, she has a lot of space in her backyard uh, for things to grow and add and remove and revise and adjust. So come learn from her, from her own experiences before you try it out. This event has already attracted a lot of interest uh, from lay people all, all over the state. So new natives in the garden, 3 p.m. virtual here on Facebook and YouTube. And it's with Jennifer Hopton Villalobos, our wonderful director at large. Uh, the most important, uh, you know, eco art event is here. For spring and this is actually a lady from uh, Austin Texas and most of you guys know uh, that they had a very deep freeze out there recently and uh, if you guys are interested in supporting artists uh, like Mary Catherine Kramer uh, I'm gonna put her link in the chat box for you guys so uh, you guys can purchase tickets and support Mary uh, but she's an eco artist uh, she's uh, she's got an excellent and just a wonderful way of connecting with nature. Uh, matter of fact, some of the uh, eco art samples are here. Um, you know, this is a, just a taste of what you guys will be taking in the class and what the uh, final product will be rendered. Uh, she actually has a short video here as well. I'm gonna uh, click on this and press play. Inner nature and farm the garden in me. If I listen to my inner nature, what does it tell me? Am I giving it what it needs? How do I love and give compassion to myself? How do I farm the garden inside of me? What is miraculous about my garden? Is it a garden of delight? I see all of it as part of me. I accept into me that energy, color, and healing vibration from the plants I utilize. The water I use nourishes, hydrates, and exchanges energy to co-create with these beings of plants and their energies. How do I form the garden inside of me? What does my heart tell me? I love that they are the inner that their inner beings. Are reflected in the outer world and my inner beings are reflected as well. These plant energies within us and our energies within them are all part of one big circle. So 
it's just it goes to show you that even artists resonate with what biologists and ecologists and scientists uh, connect with nature. So even though they're on different paths, it's almost like they're on parallel paths. So please come and discover eco printing. Uh, most of the materials are readily available in your house and uh, support a Texas artist, especially during these times. So I'll be putting the link for this. It's on Sunday, March 14th. It's virtual on Zoom at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So here are some uh, additional pictures of uh, her final product. This kind of looks like a butterfly to me if it's a Ross Arch test. And here's another one of her renderings, another. And uh, in case you guys are interested, we're having another plant sale. Uh, we had a very successful plant sale on Saturday, and this is the next one up, and it's at Sanford Garden Club on April 17th. Members, if you are interested in pre-ordering uh, your plants for, for the pre-sale event on Friday, you've already received that email. And in case you're interested in becoming a Cup of Fern member, you can always go to uh, fnps.org slash join. And uh, once you become a member, we can se uh, send that pre-sale order form to you as well. The deadline for completing the order form is March 29th. So come grow with us. We are a plant-focused uh, group. Uh, and this uh, tonight's presentation about earthworms actually does fall hand in hand because we're all about native plants. And this is talking about native earthworms. We have lots of events, workshops, community gardening. And during these times, and I've highlighted virtual learning. So we have a lot of members that are interested in distant learning. So please uh, support us by growing with us. And if you have internship, interns that are interested in internships, we're the place to go. So Florida Native Plant Society, become a member today. Go to fnps.org, uh, click on join, and then you can select couple of fern from the dropdown. They have student, household, and business level memberships. This is actually the form that you will see on fnps.org. You can scroll down, fill out all the core details and where it says chapter, you can just select a couple of firm. And it's easy as that while going and signing up for membership. And tonight, without further ado, we're talking about native earthworms. I am so excited about this topic. It's a niche topic, a rare topic, uh, a relatively unheard of topic. Uh, when it comes to the plant world. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Bruce Snyder, Dr. Matt Callahan, and Dr. Sam James. So guys, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, that'd be great. Oh, uh, Dr. Sam, you're muted. <laughs> Got to get used to this. Hi, so I'm Sam James. I've been working on earthworms in the U.S. since like 1979 or so when I just chose that as a topic. And so I've been working at different institutions and different places around the world, uh, studying earthworms, their diversity, their ecology, um, and doing a lot of uh, earthworm species discovery. Uh, in the U.S. and in South America, Asia, um, even also all over the place, basically, except Antarctica. No earthworms there. Next. Hi, everyone. My name is Bruce Snyder. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia College in Milledgeville, Georgia. I've been studying earthworms for about 20 some years now. Uh, and uh, before I was here in Georgia, I did a stint at Kansas State University, and before that, I was back in Georgia uh, at University of Georgia, where I met both Mac and Sam. And hello, everybody. My name is Mac. I'm Mac Callahan. Um, I work for the U.S. Forest Service in Athens, Georgia, um, and I also have a Kansas State connection. And I've been in the earthworm game now for coming up on 30 years. I think it was 30 years ago. Um, that Sam and I first met at a conference that my advisor was uh, hosting here in Georgia. And then uh, it's been a lifelong um, kind of 
synergistic relationship with Sam and Bruce both. So I'm very excited to be here uh, to share this presentation space with them and to tell you guys a little bit about Earthworms. It is a great honor to have you all. I'm going to add Dr. Sam's presentation here and I'm going to uh, hand it over to you guys and I'll be in the background uh, just uh, helping things go along. Okay, so I guess I'm up. So here we go. There's a lot to know about earthworms. If you care to, to look, I got to be sure I'm getting the right thing happening here. There we go. So you look at what's living in the soil and how much of it is earthworms. And you do it by the numbers of individuals. It doesn't look all that impressive. They're big. That's that little purple wedge up near the top, 12%. But if we look at it in terms of weight, you know, how much, you know, earthworms are relatively big compared to a lot of little insects and even tinier things that, that live in soil. So if we look at earthworms in terms of their total mass of animal tissue in the soil, they run around 66%. So this is like a global average. Not that meaningful, so let's break it down a little bit. And these different ecosystem types, um, forests, savannas, so a lot of the that North Florida area is kind of somewhere in between a forest and a savanna, I guess. And then you got pastures, tree plantations, earthworms are the green section of these circles. And so this is another sort of global look at earthworm abundance. And this is again by mass. Um, but you also see down there in the middle, annual crops. There's not a whole lot of life in the soil under animal crops. But in these more natural systems, earthworms are one of the major contributors of biomass. So that's one of the reasons why it's really worth looking into earthworms and figuring out what's there and what they're doing. Uh, earthworms create structure. So among those are casts or the earthworm poo, fecal material, and they can generate, depending on the system, really large amounts. So uh, a thousand metric tons, you know, it's basically that's a, a thousand tons per, that's so like a ton per acre per year or hundreds of tons per acre per year. Um, they create burrows. So they're excavating whatever, they kind of eat their way and push their way through the ground. And they create huge networks of underground passageways. And then they may create these little middens or, or um, accumulations of organic matter on the soil surface or within the soil. Uh, some species will create a deep vertical tunnel and then they'll come out, they'll eat, they'll poop. Uh, they just create all these different kinds of structures within the soil and on it. So they're constantly moving soil. We think of soil as this thing that just sort of sits there, but it's actually constantly moving. We're just not sitting there long enough to see it happen. On other places, and like this is in um, a seasonally flooded uh, flatland area of Colombia, this is, uh, the left is a vertical, you know, bird's eye view of these little mounds that are created by earthworms. Well, those mounds are, you know, they're like six to eight feet in diameter, and there's little channels of water between them, as you can see on the right. So what you've got is some big earthworms that live there. They eat the mud and they poop it out on these hummocks, and the hummocks get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it ends up being like little raised bed gardens. And people who live in these areas often will exploit these little raised beds, and they can grow crops on them in the rainy season. Otherwise, if you just leveled it all out, it would basically be all underwater. So that's big scale earthworm structuring of the landscape. But it's just as important to look at the little stuff. So castings, I mean, there's different places or different with different species of earthworms. You know, there's thousands of species of earthworms and they range in size from very small to garden hose, you know, two to, three meters, like six feet long, seven feet long. They are places of a lot of microbial activity. Um, plants like to grow on them. They like to put their roots into them. 
Uh, and there can be earthworms that are small and making little tiny fecal pellets or casts, and they could be large and making big ones, or repeatedly in the same place, making a big heap. Uh, the burrows. So the, on the left is a you know, like a cutaway view, a, a horizontal cutaway view of soil showing all of these holes that have been made by earthworms. On the right is uh, somebody got lucky and found a, a root going right down an old earthworm burrow, and you can see how that root just seems to love it and starts putting out little feeder pads onto the walls of the burrow or onto the earthworm uh, fecal material that the, the worm backfilled into its burrow. So there's lots of stuff going on. So that leads us to ask, do all earthworms do the same thing? Well, no. Quick answer. Um, there's several different types of earthworms uh, that we could say are functional categories. So we could Let's start with, uh, on the right of the screen, epigeic. That just means it lives at or near the surface of the soil, as we understand ordinary soil. And these things are primarily, they feed on earth, on um, leaf litter or other dead plant material that's very little modified. It's, it's, they're like one of the first to get at it, and they start to eat those dead leaves or um, animal droppings or whatever. So they're at or near the surface and they tend to be darkly pigmented and not to be very large. Then there's uh, another category called endogeic and there's some distinctions within that. For our purposes, um, looking at the sort of bottom um, center illustration of pale sort of pinkish earthworms, that's a sort of typical endogeic appearance not pigmented, they're just sort of uh, pinkish gray or whatever, the, you know, the color of the soil that they've eaten. And they feed on organic matter in soil, not so much on recognizable leaf fragments or something like that. And some may be more towards the surface and we might call them polyhumic. They're eating uh, organic matter that's a little bit less modified than if they're living deeper in the soil. And there's this third category we call anisic. Um, and this group of earthworms is typically large bodied. They live in a, a semi permanent or permanent burrow system. And they will feed at the surface uh, or sometimes on soil. And I could show you a few examples of each. Here's an epigeic earthworm. Um, just showing you that darker pigmentation. And it's not particularly large. These you know, epigeics maybe range in size from uh, an inch or two to three inches or four, something like that. Here are some endogeic, again, no pigmentation. All that you see there might be the result of the pinkish from their red blood uh, and the other color darkness from the soil that they've eaten. The top right, photo is a native earthworm from Georgia, be very similar to what occurs in Florida, a member of the genus Diplocardia. And they tend to have a milky body fluid on the inside. So you see this sort of mottled, blotchy, yellowish, creamy color alternating with bands of, of dark from the soil in their guts. So that's what endogeic earthworms normally look like. And then we have um, Lumbricus terrestris, also known as the nightcrawler, uh, the most common anasic earthworm found in the U.S., but it is of European origin. Uh, and I'm going to leave the topic of invasive earthworm species to um, my esteemed colleagues. But what anasics do, and what Lumbricus terrestris is really famous for, is eating dead leaves at the surface of the soil. So well, this is in the backyard of a friend uh, where the night crawlers by early spring had eaten every leaf off of the ground. And this is the last leaf that's been pulled down into the burrow opening uh, and it's going to be nibbled on by that worm. You can see there's another leaf stem off to the right of it that it already has kind of worked over. So these things can eat 
almost the entire annual leaf drop in a temperate zone deciduous forest. Again, deep vertical burrows come out in the surface to feed uh, at night typically. Um, so there may be much larger ones in different parts of the world, but this is a, a kind of what we have around here. These guys, you know, in around eight to 10 inches or so, uh, happily used for fish bait by millions of fishermen across North America, but they are European. So what have we got in North America as native earthworms? Well, we have um, various types of the family Lumbricidae. So all of these species I've shown you here are not native to North America and maybe not even present in North America, but it, it's sort of like when you're in most of the USA and you see earthworms out on the sidewalks after a heavy rain, they're a member of this family. There's a native genus uh, called Bimastos, and there are several species of that in um, the Southeast USA and more of them scattered around the um, Appalachian and the woodlands and, and even out in grasslands in Kansas, there's one or two species of, of bimastos that seem to be specialists in grasslands. But the bimastos are typically um, epigeic, kind of looking like that top left one, Heliella, but usually a little more red. There's one, um, bimastos top left and now to the other major, this is the, the most diverse group of earthworms that's native to the uh, east and south of the USA, Diplocardia. Belongs to a family that has an interesting distribution. It's all southern hemisphere except for a few representatives in the North American continent, including Mexico. And here in the USA, it's represented by Diplocardia. And there's there may be a couple hundred species of this, but we don't really know more than about uh, maybe 50 or 60 or 80 of them by now. Okay, so this uh, this is an endogeic, as I mentioned. There are other diplocardias that are a little larger and darker. There's a big one in uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Looks kind of like it might be an anisic style. Then we get into the oddballs. Um, Sparganophilus or Sparganophilidae, these are worms that live in wet places like stream banks or edges of ponds or seepages uh, where water is reaching the soil surface. There are many species um, and through the work of Bruce and Mac and their students, we're finding out that there's a lot more of these than we thought there were. The Comericiona is another um, Oh, sorry, that's not a Comericiona. That's that's what uh, the castings of a Sparganophilus look like. There's the water on the left and this sort of fine textured little blobs of, of fecal matter that they, they deposit at the water's edge. I don't have a photo of Comericiona etani. That's a, a big gap in my photo collection, but they're typically, they're very pale, uh, and they're not very large, maybe uh, two, three inches long, and they live in forests in the Appalachian Mountain region. Uh, we know of them from um, Maryland through Kentucky and a few other places. But it's a unique species to North America. It's a unique family to North America. There might be another one in North Georgia, but we're still trying to catch it again. And another unusual one in North America's native earthworm uh, stable is this, Lutodrillus. These are big, they're like a foot long and they're this dark gray green. We've got the head and tail, uh, perhaps two heads. That's always hard to tell, you know. You just wa watch which end goes first. Anyway, they live in uh, fine grained, muddy places and um, Mac and I have wonderful memories of finding this worm after a hard day of slocking around into the in creek bottoms and bayous and whatnot in Louisiana. It's only known from the Pearl River drainage in Louisiana, not yet found in Mississippi or anywhere else. But I wouldn't be surprised if it does occur elsewhere. 
So where do we have native earthworms in North America? Well, this is really um, defined by the recent history of the continent, in particular glaciation. This map shows you the extents of the major glacial periods of the last two million years. And you can see the sort of peach colored one, that kind of defines the limits now. And uh, yet there were other more extensive glaciations such as the Kansan. However, there are native earthworms in all of that um, southern part of that, that green bit that in parts of um, Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska. There are earthworms native to the U.S. in those. But if you look to the east, you know, east of the Mississippi, the native earthworm distribution remarkably close to that line of the glacial maximum. But there's one other thing that was limiting to earthworm distributions, not just the presence of a huge mass of ice, but also the climate around the glaciation. Notice there's this thing called the driftless area in the middle there in southwestern Wisconsin, never glaciated. It's totally free of native earthworms. Why? It was permafrost. So this doesn't show us in the U.S. in any great detail, but you can see all around that pink boundary of the continental ice sheets, you have a area of blue, which is permafrost. And some of that permafrost extended down through the Appalachian Mountain areas. So earthworms in modern conditions do not live in permafrost areas. So we make the educated guess that they didn't live in permafrost conditions back then either. So that's where we see native earthworms. How do we know that they're native earthworms? We have, you know, this was a, a question that was much more difficult uh, 100 or 200 years ago, but now that we know, where do we find the members of the, fa the Lumbricity family? Typically we find them in Europe. There's two groups of them in North America, but the vast majority of them live in Europe. But the same dozen or so species of European earthworms that we find in the US, you can also find in New Zealand, Australia, even uh, cooler climates in tropical countries. So they're clearly recognized now as earthworms that have traveled well. There are other examples from other parts of the world that are now present in the US, and you'll be hearing more about that in a few minutes. So it's uh, the process of identification uh, and sort of mapping out where these things occur. Those lead us to know that we have the certain earthworms that are native and certain that are not in North America. So you can learn a few things with earthworm studies. Um, they Earthworms don't get around right, themselves very much. So over long spans of time, you can kind of see how their distributions map the old uh, movements of continents. You can see how they've been influenced by climate change, uh, such as glaciation over the last hundreds, tens to thousands of years, up to millions. Um, you can see various other things. And in the last uh, centuries of, of global human movement and commerce and picking stuff up in one country and moving it to another, including plants, um, you find out that humans are now one of the major forces in earthworm distributions. And of course, what we do on a day-to-day -day scale can really affect earthworms' uh, ability to survive in a place, you know, so how we conduct our agricultural processes and, and manage land. So I'm going to stop there and leave time for everybody else. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sam, for that great introduction. And uh, before I forget, thanks to, to everybody who's made this possible. Uh, yeah. And so if hopefully Sam has already convinced you that earthworms are big, 
in soils and they're really big movers of soil. Uh, here is a, a fecal pellet pile of one of our local diplocardias that Sam has already introduced you to and they're can be pretty significant and, and noticeable uh, when you're walking in the forest. But one thing that is sort of widely believed is that earthworms are always good. And the reality is sometimes they are. And you know, as a, an ecologist, I really struggle to even think about them as good and bad. Uh, but because of the diversity of earthworms, there are a diversity of things that they do. And so we're going to talk a bit now about invasive species. Before I get too far into it, uh, I just want to lay out the definition because I know that a lot of people think about invasive species in different ways. And I'm thinking of non-native species, ones that are not from North America, which are causing some kind of damage in the environment. Maybe that's ecological damage, maybe that's economic, can happen in a number of different ways. And a lot of invasive species are really visible to people, right? So if we think about some of the, the big invasives in Florida, we have things like Burmese python uh, invading the Everglades, uh, lionfish, these are happening in aquatic and marine systems as well, or uh, what a lot of people call mimosa, this, this albizia, uh, which is not from North America. And it may be pretty, but it expands very rapidly. But it's not just those visible above ground species. There are also a lot of below ground species. So if we think about our common, especially urban soil fauna, a lot of that is non-native. So these isopods, uh, most of our visible isopods are European. Uh, here are some uh, millipede and a centipede as well that are well, one's from Europe and one is Asian. And so a, a lot of time I will say non-native because we don't necessarily have the data to show that these are really causing damage, but they're definitely not originally from North America. Earthworms also comprise some of our uh, invasive and non-native species. And this is a problem that is global. So this is uh, a figure out of a paper that we did a few years ago. And each of the numbers in each of the, the regions represents a different earthworm family. And the ones that are in those sort of reddish circles indicate that there are at least some introduced taxa from that family that are in that region. And so, as you can see, in every biogeographical region, there are invasive, or at least non-native species from other biogeographical regions. And poor Australia has only families that have some introduced taxa in them. Now, here in North America, we have about 175 or so species of earthworms that we know about so far, lots of undescribed stuff. And about a third of those are non-native. A lot are European, especially some of the Lambricidae that Sam was talking about. And we have a lot of Asian species as well. And here are some more of, uh, some more of those European species pictured for you. And as, as Sam mentioned also, these species aren't, they, were, they came here after the glaciers had retreated. And so unlike our native species, they are not limited by that glaciation. So this is uh, a map showing the distribution of these two species, at least as we knew it in the mid nineties. And that black line that's going through that map is showing the limit of the Wisconsin and glaciation. Thinking more specifically about Florida, from what we know of the Florida earthworm fauna, more than half of it is non-native. So this presents a real challenge for us. Now, part of this is uh, a data problem that we have as well. And so these earthworms may look familiar to you. They may be in Florida, but if you look at the map there, they're not represented uh, in, on that map at that time. And so we have some challenges with the data uh, that goes into these maps right now, simply because we have not done enough collecting to really determine 
where these species are. Here are some more maps from a paper that uh, is in preparation right now. And these are looking at some of our Asian species. It's three species of Amenthus, uh, which I will talk about more in a bit. And, and if you take a look at where the dots are on the maps, each of those crosses that glacial maximum. And there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge. So for any one of these species, so if we just focus on uh, Amenthus agrestis on the left here, there's one dot in Florida. And I'm sure that this species has found many more locations, but we just don't have the data right now to show that. Earthworms are very easy to move around. Uh, anytime you're moving soil, you have the potential to move them around. And historically, they've been moved around unintentionally. They used to use ship ballast uh, in the very early days of colonization to when they were uh, going back and forth between here and Europe. And so if they picked up soil in Europe and dumped it in North America, then they were definitely transporting earthworms and other soil fauna. They probably brought soil with plants as well. And there was intentional introductions of earthworms also. Uh, it was well known, uh, even at Darwin's time in the, the 1850s, that earthworms uh, were special and they, they did a, a lot of potentially good things in, in certain situations. And so they were certainly brought and are commonly introduced to agricultural systems. And they also get used as bait as well. Those are the historic uses and those uses continue. And so introductions and spread of these species continue, whether it's through earth moving activities or through uh, movement of horticultural plants as well. Uh, this picture in the middle is one of my favorite ones from Mac and he was planting some blueberries and he, he picked up the pot of the plant out of the pot and there were some invasive earthworms sitting right there in the bottom. They picked a bad pot to be sitting in. Um, and this is another one of my favorite examples of how easily these move around. This is the gutter from in front of my uh, old house in Kansas. And I was clearing this grass out of the gutter and uh, scraping that up. And lo and behold, probably hard to see on your screen, but there are a couple of small invasive earthworms. So they're being transported by movement of, of water and soil in other ways as well. And so this poses uh, a pretty big challenge because these earthworms also can make some very major changes to ecosystems. Our best knowledge about the effects of earthworm introductions are from those places north of the glacial margin. Uh, and in this map, the gray area is, that's filled in is where we know that there are native species. So that gives you kind of a sense of how they're limited by that glacial distribution. But in these locations where the red dots are in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and, and more, there were no native earthworms. And so when invasive earthworms were introduced, they caused major changes to those systems because those systems did not evolve with earthworms. And so we see systems that go like go from something like this where there's lots of leaf litter, nice lush understory. You can see a number of maple ceilings there to something that looks more like this. So these earthworms are especially Lumbricus terrestris um, and its friends are pretty voracious. So we have a lot of the European worms that come in and they really eat up that leaf litter. And that can lead to a whole cascade of problems from erosion and subsidence of the soil. Of course, you remove that litter layer, you change everything about how nutrient cycling and uh, plants, especially rare plants, how they can then regenerate in that system, uh, even down to the tree seedlings. So I've illustrated a very extreme example of that, but all of these problems do exist in those systems when earthworms come in. Of course, the situation is a little bit different down here because we already had native earthworms and we already have uh, uh, environments that have evolved with those native earthworms. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this one species primarily, uh, Amenthus agrestis. It's one of the Asian species. It's in a group called the uh, which we lovingly call Amenthus and Friends. 
And there are 16 of those pheromone species known so far in the US. And they've been here for a long time. Uh, we know since at least the 1880s they've been around, but there's been a lot of research. Uh, it, it's really a growing area over the last 10 years or so, um, especially as these have been discovered in places like Wisconsin. Uh, and so there's sort of the second wave of invasions. But we've been studying them for down here, at least I have for, for almost 20 years. Uh, Amenthus agrestis is, if if you learned from Sam's talk and you were looking at this picture, then you probably saw it was pigmented and uh, this is one of those epigeic species. It lives up in the leaf litter and primarily feeds on leaf litter. It's kind of unique and we see this a lot in Amenthus agrestis and somewhat in the other pheromone groups. They move in a very snake-like mm -hmm. fashion. They, uh, when they're picked up, they will thrash around and can even self amputate for, and this is a, a defense mechanism. So you pick them up, they break in half and it's really weird. And so you drop them and they get away and predators do the same thing. And their the predators are left with the tail and they can eat the tail and the predator ignores the rest of it. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what happens when Amenthus agrestis moves into an environment. And we've seen both physical effects and uh, biological effects. The biggest thing is that they're living in that leaf litter and they're eating it up. And so these are some soil cores from uh, my, one of my field sites up in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And in looking at the core, we have this layer of recently falling leaf, leaf litter, probably over the last year, and then a nice thick layer of partially decomposed leaf litter just below that. And then below that bottom red line, it pretty quickly goes down to mineral soil. This is what plots of this field site without Amenthus agrestis look like. And once Amenthus moves in, you get a huge reduction in that uh, partially decomposed layer. And so in the northern forests, when they have invasions, you can often tell where the invasions are because the leaf litter is gone. You don't see that so much down here. You still have that top layer. Um, in these soil cores, it's a little thinner, but uh, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily tell unless you start digging around and looking for things. Okay. But you still have that huge reduction in the leaf litter and it's that's a problem, as you can imagine, for lots of organisms. They're eating that material and then they're creating uh, lots of castings. And so their activity creates these really big soil aggregates. And so the scale bar there is in centimeters. And so these are some big granular chunks of soil that you wouldn't necessarily see without the presence of Amenthus. Some of it's casting, some of it may be broken down burrows and other sorts of things. And so to give you a, a sense of what that looks like, I was able to get some Amenthus from uh, a site around uh, near Atlanta where They've invaded and we're going to do some research and I brought them back to the lab and I put them in with some soil and leaf litter. And this is what that entire tub looks like right now. Lots of big granular casts, almost no leaves left. Uh, you just have some twigs. And so some of these maybe look kind of like broken burrows, but the rest are, are primarily castings. So major structural changes. And then they also affect uh, the fauna. And so the other group that I work on is millipedes. And what we found in, in the field was that when they move in, you lose a lot of the millipedes, not just the individuals, but also the number of species that are actually present. And that's what's illustrated in those graphs on the right. Uh, as you get more and more frequently invaded, moving to the right, you have some big decreases in species and millipede density. And we also confirmed this with a couple of lab studies. So we took these little one liter takeout containers and we put a large millipede in together with one of these large earthworms and let them go basically until they died. And we tracked the time until mortality. And we saw two main things. I won't spend a lot of time on the graphs. Uh, one is that they really do prefer to eat that partially decomposed leaf litter and they live longer when they eat that partially decomposed leaf litter. 
Uh, and then the millipedes die a lot faster when there are earthworms present, especially if all they have is the partially decomposed lip. If they're, they're not necessarily competing for that material, then it's a little bit of a different situation. And so with my last couple of slides, I want to talk about what are some sort of looking at the towards the future. You know, what are things we can do for invasive earthworms in general? What are our sort of future needs? And I've got this in, in kind of three big categories. The first one is we need to prevent further introductions. And that uh, really is determined by how can we prevent people moving them around? Because most of the the spread is due to people moving them around. So limiting bait introductions. If there are mach if there's machinery that's doing big earth moving activities and going from site to site, trying to make sure those are getting washed off properly and there aren't big chunks of soil moving. We know they can move in soil. Uh, there's some evidence from the Northeast that they can move with mulch as well. And so potentially looking at how to limit the transfer of that or making sure those materials are clean before they're moved. Uh, and even if that soil is in with plants, being careful about that sort of thing. And so I think a lot of this will eventually come down to regulations on those materials, but a big part of that is education. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we can do this today and, and talk about it and start to get the word out that this is a potential challenge. Uh, people need to be responsible with things like bait. And I think most people are responsible, but they don't necessarily know that they shouldn't just take their bait and dump it at their favorite fishing site because it may live there. Um, and eventually I think we'll have some regulations go into place. Uh, and so the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, here's a sign where they have added, uh, they have no live bait allowed. And so they're, they're doing a much better job of getting the word out for that. One reason that preventing introductions is really important is because it's very hard to control introductions once they have started, right? Once the earthworms are there and they are established, it's pretty much impossible to get rid of them, right? You can't just dig up the, the entirety of the soil and eliminate them by hand. Uh, it's just way too intensive. There's no vermicide to, to just kill them because there's nothing that's really specific. There are things that will kill earthworms, but they're gonna kill everything else too. And so we generally don't want to do that. And especially here where there are native earthworms, we don't want to do that. And so one thing we've looked into is fire. And I think Mac will touch on this uh, a little bit in his portion of the talk. Uh, but we've done some studies where they've been able to burn off the leaf litter, which is you know, a natural process down here. And it didn't kill the earthworms initially, but it removed their food source and it made their cocoons, their egg stage, not viable. And that's what you can see in that, that graph there, huge reductions in that viability. So that's a potential thing that we're trying to explore more. And so my third uh, thing here is we really need to do more research to understand okay, who's living here. Uh, we need to know a lot about the taxonomy and there aren't a lot of taxonomists that, that do this. We need to understand the ecological effects and I think doing more with earthworms and fire and trying to understand the interactions there. Uh, one of the things that Mac has been doing that I don't know if he'll have time for today is trying to model, use computer models to figure out whether you can have these reductions. And so these graphs are from uh, a couple of those, those models showing with the right fire in return interval, you can potentially reduce those earthworm populations. And that is, I think, the end of my portion. And so I will turn it over to Mac to um, expand on that if he desires. OK. Make sure everybody can see this. For reasons that I can't explain, um, I can't see you guys and I don't know if um, I don't know if this is visible or not so I'm just gonna back out for a second so I can confirm that you you were you be the head yeah okay great I'm gonna go back um, two things so I'm sure many people in the audience are wondering how could there possibly be any more to say about earthworms 
Um, I hope I'm going to be able to convince you that um, there are a few really interesting things, and we're finally going to get around to uh, the specific biology and ecology of earthworms that are in Florida, and I'm going to talk mostly about worms that are native to Florida. Um, uh, the second thing I want to say is that until two years ago, I did not have a beard, but hanging around with Bruce and Sam um, made me start to feel like I was inadequate in some way and that nobody was ever going to take me seriously as an earthworm scientist until I got a beard. So I'm working on that. And, um, you know, you can make some comments in the comment sections as to whether or not you think it's working. Uh, again, I just say I work for the U.S. Forest Service. Um, most of the work I've done over the course of my career has been on the national forests in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, and a few other states. Um, so I, I want to go through a little history of earthworm ecology in Florida. And it goes back to a place called Tall Timbers. And I don't know if any of the people in the audience, I, I'm sure you're aware of the existence of Tall Timbers Research Station but you may not be aware that it was a real hotbed of earthworm taxonomy and systematics and ecology for a number of years and during the 70s. And it was mainly these three people. Um, G.E. Gates is truly the father of North American earthworm uh, systematics and ecology. And he was, um, among other things, a Guggenheim fellow and uh, had a career that, that spanned a number of different institutions, but he spent a while as one of the Beetle Fellows at Tall Timbers, uh, working with the Comeric family. Uh, and two of his students were John Reynolds and Virginia Vale. And so both of those folks actually did some really um, early and seminal work um, to try to describe some of the basic biology of earthworms in, in Florida and the southeastern U.S., both native and non-native. So uh, Sam's already touched on this a little bit. So I want to just go through the list of families that you have extant in Florida that are native to, to uh, native to Florida. So the Acanthodrilidae um, are those Diplocardia worms, and as of today, we think there are something like 11 species in that genus that live in Florida. The real number is probably quite a bit higher than that, maybe double or even triple that number. Um, within the lumbricity, Sam mentioned the bimastos. Uh, there are reported five species in bimastos and two species in another genus called Isonoides. Um, and then in the Sparganophilidae, we think there are eight species. We know there are eight species that are named and reported from Florida, but I'll show you some evidence at the end of the talk to suggest that there may be actually quite a few more species in that in that family than we had previously recognized. Um, so one of the things that got me interested in earthworm ecology in the first place was this, uh, the situation that is occurring in Apalachicola National Forest. Um, if any of you are native plant fans, uh, I hope you've had a chance to go botanize in the Apalachicola because it is a truly incredible place in terms of plant diversity. Um, it's also the home of this uh, interesting cottage industry of uh, folks going out into the woods after a prescribed fire to harvest bait. And that is a standard, you know, maybe three inch long Swiss army knife. So these are whoppers of uh, a species of earthworm, Diplocardia mississippiensis. So I'm also, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's true that so much of, uh, of what we think of as native Florida is really dependent upon the occurrence of fire. And I, if we have enough time, maybe we can go into some of these details. But I think that fire is another major ecological process that has done a lot to shape the, the composition of our native earthworm fauna. Um, and in particular, if you think about fires, uh, if you think about systems like the longleaf pine flatwoods or even in the Red Hills region of Florida, um, if you get a frequent fire, you don't really have enough leaf litter hanging around for there to be very many species of earthworms that are gonna live in leaf litter. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have so many uh, species of, of native worms that are strictly endogeic. And maybe also the reason why in a fire suppressed world that we live in now, we're seeing so many of the non-native species move in that are these leaf litter dwelling species. All right, so anyway, if we think about fire in Florida, so this is a fire that's happening the picture that you can see is in Osceola National Forest, actually, not Apalachicola, but they're functionally quite similar. So after the Forest Service goes in and does one of their patented 800 acre to 2000 acre prescribed fires on one of their management units, 
in the Apalachicola, there is a group of people who very quickly move in. You can see the ground is still black here and the grasses have only sprouted back maybe two or three centimeters. And these folks go in and they drive a wooden stake into the ground and they rub a leaf spring or some other kind of piece of metal. Sometimes they use a lawnmower blade or something like that. And when they rub those pieces of metal across the, the stob, as it's called, it sets up a vibration and these vibrations cause the earthworms to come up out of the ground. And so they usually operate in a crew of three or four folks, one person who's operating the grunting iron and the stob, and then two or three other folks who kind of cruise around behind them and all around and about them and pick up all the worms that come to the surface. And in this photo, you can see there's three or four uh, in addition to the worm that she's got in her grasp there, um, worms right on the surface, just right there within that square yard or so. And so what they do is they gather them up until they have their cans almost full and then they dump them out and count them out into lots of 500. Um, and then they take those to the local bait uh, retailer and sell them for what is a varying amount of money per can, depending on supply and demand. So we could go into the microeconomics of it as well, but I'm more interested in the ecology. So well, the first question that the Forest Service really needed to answer, and this is back in the days when I was still beardless and uh, maybe 21, 22 year old kid, I'm crouched there wearing the Chicago Cubs hat behind Paul Hendricks, who was the, the lead PI on this study. So the Forest Service needed to ask, does bait harvesting have a negative impact on earthworm populations? Is, is it a sustainable practice or not? And so we did a study where we had paired plots. We kind of roped off an area where we asked them not to go in and collect, and then actually stood around and actively encouraged them to collect uh, on the other side of that rope. And then we, then we went back in and sampled on either side to see if we could detect a difference in the population levels. And in fact, um, our paired plots study showed that they were noticeably impacted by the bait harvesting activity. But if we, if we went on for two years and sampled on either side of that line, we found that indeed the populations pretty much recovered to their pre-harvest levels, um, certainly within the time it would take for them to return uh, for the next fire return interval. So within two years, populations seem to recover. And so that was a, that was the first little uh, foray that we, we did into this bait harvesting um, study. And then my, some of my early graduate work um, showed that earthworms were in fact pretty important to the uptake of nutrients by longleaf and wiregrass plants. And so, you know, if there was a situation where you really wanted to make sure that your wiregrass or longleaf got, were getting adequate nutrition, you might want to just prevent bait harvesting during the early phases of maybe a, a plantation or a restoration uh, effort. Okay, so then later on, uh, I was contacted by some folks in Canada, these, these people, uh, Umber Mitra and his major professor, Jane Yak, they were interested in the, the acoustic biology. So they're, they're acoustic biologists, which is something I didn't even know existed until she emailed me one day. And so what they wanted to do was put a, an instrument array in the ground around somebody who was doing the earthworm grunting and see if they could do, you know, collect really good measurements of frequency and amplitude and these kinds of things to see if we could figure out what it was exactly about these vibrations that was causing the worms to come to the surface. So this is a video which I hope works. Okay, so for those of you who um, didn't know what grunting sounded like. That's an example. I'm going to play it one more time because I love it. Okay, and so after that, um, this is a video that will show the worms. There, That worm is coming out of a hole in the ground right now. I'll play it again. All right, so that's kind of what the process looks like. Whoops. Okay, so uh, in this little graph, I don't know if we need to spend a ton of time with uh, the graphs, but the star in the big square panel on the left is the location of the stake as we drove it in. And then the squares are the position of the microphones or geophones that they placed in the ground. 
And then you can see that the relative amplitude and the number of worms is kind of attenuated with distance from the stake. And so if we, and all the little circles are represent holes that earthworms came out of. So we thought this was a pretty interesting result. Okay, so why do the worms come out of the ground? We think that it's probably to avoid moles. This is a final video that I'll show you. This is from a guy named Kenneth Catania, who is a professor at uh, Vanderbilt University. And so what he did is he built these little arenas that have soil and earthworms in them. And then that's a hamster cage tube, the green thing sticking off to the top there. And he's about to um, introduce a mole into that tube. And I'll just let the video speak for itself after that. So here comes the mole and it's digging in. And pretty much instantaneously, the worms start coming out. And this is all, uh, this is, this video is a supplementary material to the paper that he published in PLOS One. I think if you typed in earthworm, Catania, PLOS One, you would um, be able to view that over and over again if you wanted to and read the very interesting paper that he produced. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the Diplocardia story. And now I want to move on to uh, to the future. I think the future of earthworm systematics and, and, and earthworm ecology in Florida uh, looks pretty bright. We've been finding a lot of really interesting things. So this guy's name is Hiroshi Ikeda, and he came over from Japan to, to do a postdoc in my lab for on two separate occasions. And so Hiroshi and I went and dug up these uh, Sparganophilus worms. Those are the semi-aquatic ones that Sam was talking about. They live right on the margins of lakes and ponds. and um, we actually did go down into Florida. There, everywhere you see a green dot is a place that we sample. Um, we sampled in uh, more than 2,000 specimens over, I think, 23 or 24 states in the east. And Hiroshi's phylogenetic analysis suggests that there are many, many undescribed genera and dozens of new species. So our idea was that we would sample in all the major drainages, reasoning that since these worms are semi-aquatic and they can't really get out of their um, semi-aquatic habitat to move over land, that each drainage might in, have its own sort of um, radiation event and its own species. And so we collect, drove all over the place, collected these worms, and then did the analysis. And so this is just a very quick uh, example. So this is called a species area curve, and it basically shows the number of species that were collected per number of sites sampled. And if you look at those curves, the ones that are very, very steep, where you get up to eight species um, over 10 sites, it suggests that our sampling effort has not really been adequate to capture the actual um, level of diversity that's represented by those groups. So we kind of get an idea of where we need to go back and do more sampling. These, these curves are based on uh, relative latitude position in North America. So the middle latitudes look like they've got a lot more diversity to uh, to show before we're finished. And so then I just wanted to very quickly show another, uh, another one of my students. This is uh, Roberto Carrera Martinez and Melanie Taylor, and they did a very intensive study. So unlike Hiroshi's study, which was extensive, we decided we would really focus on three watersheds uh, in Georgia and South Carolina. And Roberto has done a bunch of morphological descriptions and we're working on the molecular data now. And so this is just in our three sample, three sample sites. These are 10 species of earthworm that have never been uh, found or described before. And so um, we basically take from this that we were really going to need to do a bunch more work before we're finished um, describing the diversity that's, that's present in this group alone. And so some of those samples are from Florida and hopefully we'll be down your way again to finish off our collecting soon. And with that, I think we should probably just uh, break, break here and start answering some of your questions. I hope you, this the presentations have generated a few. All right, I think um, Mac, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So the only thing is when we test ran your presentation, we were able to hear the uh, the grunt or the, uh, the oh no action. And while you were playing it, it didn't come through. So oh, that's too it, bad. 
I think Bruce also has a backup of it, but if you can pull up your presentation, we can uh, try to go back and see if you had perhaps muted your presentation, uh, but the uh, the audio was pretty cool, so it would be worth revisiting. If, you, if, do you have access to that, Bruce? Yeah, I've, I've got it, and I, it'll be full screen for me since you've got that weird problem. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> it sounds like a. Yeah, we think so too. <laughs> sounds like a toad in the swamp. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put uh, member. Uh, people always ask me for uh, a couple of foreign information, so I'm just gonna paste it into the uh, into the comments right now. But we got a lot of questions already, so I'm just gonna take it all the way up from the top. Um, Julieta writes. Uh, and I think this is something that you guys can expand, expand on. Uh, native versus non-native earthworms, not all non-native introduced species turn into invasive species. Can you give examples of both? What are your thoughts on naturalized earthworms? Is there anything such as that? Well, I can, I can take a shot at that. So, uh, yeah, definitely. It's easy. It's relatively easy to say native versus non-native. And we definitely have both of those. Uh, some of the native, the non-native species, I would definitely call invasive. Uh, so Amenthus agrestis is a great example of that. Uh, I, I think you can, you can. There's a lot of species you could probably argue about, and I, I think if you asked all three of us, we'd probably have slightly different opinions on which ones were truly invasive versus just non-native. Uh, I don't. I can't think of any that I would call naturalized at this point, but I'd, I'd love to hear Mac and Sam's comments on that as well. Sam, go. <laughs> well, I mean, it gets down into the weeds, but you know, like um, there's a, little glowing worm called Microscolex phosphorius. It's small, it's scattered around, but it I don't think there's any place that I've heard of where it would actually qualify as a problem. Uh, so it's it's been established as populations here and there. And we could probably think of a few other uh, cases, even from the European lumbricity that have reached USA. So, you know, some of them have, yeah, you can find them, but they're not very common and uh, in contrast to certain species that are extremely common, they're all over the place and do big tr transformations in forested habitats, for example. Florida may have, uh, I have to check, but Florida might have in the South popu some populations of the Earth's number one most abundant earthworm, uh, which is from South America, Pontoscolex corythrurus. Um, and it yeah, is, it's there. it's there. It's tremendously invasive. It tr greatly transforms soils. I mean, it, it just like uh, some of the amenthas, it just eats everything. And there's like this, you end up with this dense Swiss cheese of soil. It's like compacted except where it's a burrow. Uh, not good. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's probably coming somewhere near you. I don't think yeah, it can but, tolerate frost or or cold temperatures, though. So I have um, I have what might be somewhat controversial point of view, even to Sam and Bruce about about some of these European worms, right? Um, which is that many of them have have literally been here for centuries so i'm thinking about lumbricus terrestris lumbricus rubellus some of the octalasian species and those things right and what i find about them is that you know they're they're kind of urban in their distribution primarily or or at least suburban right and so in the soils of the piedmont which is where i live and try to grow vegetables every year 
um, some, some years with better success than others. Um, you know, the history of the soils of the Piedmont is one of real, uh, it's a tragic tale really of exploitation and erosion. And in a lot of places, all we have left is just a kind of a cap of really hard red clay. And so kind of my point of view in that kind of situation where the soil itself has been utterly transformed from what would have been the native condition that, you know, any worm is a good worm in that, in that context, right? Worms are still doing worm things and they're, you know, they're making nutrients available to plants. They're doing all the work that Sam talked about of aeration and improving water infiltration and those kinds of things. And I have a hard time uh, holding a grudge against a European worm living in soil that would otherwise be a biological desert. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, I think it's like everything in ecology, it, it's shades of gray and it's depends on the context, right? Very interesting. Um, so, yeah. yeah, that's about all I got to say about that. A, a very nuanced, uh, and not a straightforward answer by any measure. Uh, Sailor Girl writes, is that the bioluminescent one? She was referring to, uh, I think it was called Lumbricus terrestris. Um, is it bioluminescent at all, or is she thinking about something different? Perhaps we will revisit that. Uh, Dr. James, you got some fan mail. Uh, someone says, thank you, Dr. James. That was more interesting than I could have ever imagined. Um, Ron writes, will this be viewed after the live video? Absolutely. So it'll be in the YouTube library and you guys can share and embed um, great educational content. Um, Rory writes, any cases of exotic earthworms being introduced during, uh, to a habitat in the plants being set out for restoration? So like, for example, if we're uh, buying you know, restoration plugs for perhaps longleaf pine restoration, et cetera. Have we um, mistakenly introduced exotic earthworms or perhaps even earthworms from one location in Florida to another? Would that pose a problem of any sort, uh, especially with native earthworms relocating them? I don't, I don't know of any documented example of that, but I can almost guarantee you that it has happened. Um, that that both native and non-native worms are getting moved around in in restoration efforts. Um, uh, you know what's interesting to me is that I, I feel like the the uh, plant plant material production industry has gotten a whole lot cleaner in in recent decades. Um, you know, so I think that nursery operations that are growing bullet containers for uh, wiregrass plugs and those kinds of things, I bet those are, are clean as a whistle. Um, but having said that, I mean, I know that there are lots of people who, who collect plants, collect live plants, and when you dig up a live plant and bring it into your yard, the odds are that you're moving a bunch of other biological material that is unintended, um, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing it, you know, with a root ball. Some people, I guess, have, scrup have some scruples and try to um, do bare root transplants. And that, that would be what I would advise if, if your listeners or the viewers are involved in that kind of activity. But um, yeah, I, I don't, to answer Rory's question, I don't know of any examples of where it's been done in, intentionally or documented unintentionally, but I'm sure that it is going on. Right, still lots of study to be done. Um, Leah writes, this is a great question, and this is uh, from our composting friends in Orlando. So what are composting worms, and how can I keep my vermicompost from spreading invasive eggs? So what do you guys have to say about that? Mm -hmm. um, composting earthworms, uh, the most common one is uh, so-called red wigglers or Isenia fetida, and they don't live very well in ordinary soil conditions. Now they may like crawl around and search for a nice big pile of organic matter uh, where they would make their home and live and eat and breed. Uh, but um, they're pretty much like what we would say a fugitive species looking for those piles of organic matter. So, yeah, there could be some concern in, in places with a lot of uh, 
organic matter that's building up naturally that's part of the system. But mostly, you know, if it's you're using it as a compost, as a soil amendment in a gardening context or house plants or something, I don't think that's going to do much in the way of spreading them. But I will allow um, the invasive specialists to sound off. Which would be Bruce or Mac? Or I don't know if I have too much to add to that. Uh, the the one thing that I would caution people about is if if you're going and purchasing earthworms, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. Uh, there's a lot of common names. Uh, a lot of the people who who grow worms and market worms have their different types, and they can recognize the differences. Uh, but they're not necessarily going into the taxonomy, and they're not they're not necessarily necessarily doing earthworm dissections to confirm that they really have all one kind of thing. So. I think that can be a challenge in all of that. Yeah, I'm biting my tongue because I have an entire one hour long presentation on this very topic. And uh, I'm sure we don't want to get into that level of detail, but I would echo Bruce's caution, which is that, you know, you may think you're getting Isenia fetida, the compost worm, right? Or one of the other well-known, well, uh, well understood compost worms. But the truth is, is that um, if you, mail order these worms, you can get any one of 11 species, including some of the ones that um, Bruce was talking about. There are amenthus uh, contaminations of worm, you know, worm beds. Uh, and it's just better not to, not to buy them and move them around, in my opinion. Um, so maybe I can come back and talk about compost worms sometime. Oh, we'd love to. Um... Yeah, uh, hang tight. I, I actually might have an opportunity for you all. So uh, perhaps we'll discuss it right after the uh, webinar. Uh, Promelia writes, thank you so much. And uh, she actually has a question. Uh, she says, could I get some earthworms to put in my compost pile? Where do I do that? So she's trying to go the native route. How do we help? just regular citizens that want to use native earthworms for their compost pile, what would be a standard recommendation for you guys? I think it's, a, again, a very complicated and nuanced answer here. Well, the first uncomplicated and unnuanced answer is we don't have any compost worms that are native to North America. The best candidates would be bimastos, a couple of the bimastos species, but so far I don't think anyone has really looked into that and done the experiment. The really the only ones are the Isenia, um, and there's a couple of other species that are from tropical countries that I, I don't think I would recommend. Yeah, so what? that kind of goes that kind of goes yeah. back to what I was talking about earlier. You know, our the native fauna of North America is really not very rich in those litter dwelling and organic matter dwelling species. And I think in the east it may really have to do with the, our long history and association with fire in those ecosystems. There's just not enough material for them to either have survived the the activity of humans and their their penchant for setting fires everywhere they go. Uh, talking about the Native Americans at this point, um, or they just never evolved in the first place. So, gotcha. Yeah, oh, gotcha. bimastos is the closest. Yeah, there. Um, so, so the advice I would give to the to the questioner though is that um, if she has worms in her yard, they will find the compost pile, and and you know just let the ones that are already there do the job instead of trying to buy something from somewhere else, which may or may not already be represented in the local fauna. Um, you know, it's been my experience everywhere that I've lived and including on some of these scabbed off Piedmont soils that if you make a big pile of organic matter, the worms that can live there will find it and they'll live there. Uh, agreed. All right. Um, Sailor Girl writes, does worm grunting work on specific soil types? Is it uh, soil specific or does it work pretty much anywhere that you can 
uh, apply it. It seems to work best in sandy soil. Um, and that I think has to do with the way the sound waves move through that, that matrix. But you can do it in, in heavier clay soils. It's just not quite as effective. Um, that, that worm right there <laughs> was collected via grunting and that was in a, a, you know, kind of a mountain, not heavy clay, but a silty soil anyway. So yeah, it seems to work best on these Diplocardia worms though. It doesn't seem to work real well on other worm species. In my experience, maybe, you know, Sam's got the most experience in this arena. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was digging up somewhere in West Virginia and um, I was banging away at the shovel with a shovel and some root or something was vibrating. And I started seeing um, earthworms coming out of the leaf litter you know, <laughs> quite a distance from where I was. And so I kept at it and I got a good pile of Isenoides, uh, which was one of the native North American um, lumbricity. That's a forest floor, uh, leaf litter, soil interface kind of dwelling earthworm. So, and I've seen it work on other kinds of earthworms in other places, but uh, not super reliably. I mean, you don't know if they're going up or down when you start vibrating, and it could be either. Very good. Um, this is actually a burning question for a lot of uh, native plant enthusiasts here in our region. So when I was researching some of the uh, native earthworms, you know, local to Orange, Seminole, uh, Volusia, the uh, service area that Couple of Fern has, uh, there was just a huge paucity of images. Like uh, we, we saw, you know, graphics, like illustrations of these earthworms, but where can we find images to educate viewers. So uh, this Facebook user says, can we use the images uh, in this presentation to educate viewers? Is there a nice resource that you guys can recommend that we can uh, compare earthworms in the field? So unfortunately, uh, we really don't have a, a very good resource. I mean, the it's just been a group that's that's been neglected and you know, the three of us and a handful of others have done have done a lot, but we haven't quite gotten to the stage of uh, putting together a book or a manual. Although we've we've been working on it on the side for a, lo a long time. Uh, I'm okay with people sharing pictures from uh, at least my part of the presentation, as long as there's there's credit for that. You know, just just put my name on it, uh, and. Yeah, there there haven't been a lot of really good online resources. I mean, it, it's tough when you're working with something that's, you know, underground most of the time. Yeah, uh, most of my slides are cobbled together from so many different sources. I, I can't remember who to blame for them, but um, you know, if you uh, want to share one of those images, it's it's fine with me. But most of it was funded with taxpayer dollars anyway, so it's all yours. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same for me. I, those pictures of uh, Gates and Reynolds and Vale are not mine, uh, and, I, and I just basically lifted them from the internet. But um, everything else of mine is in the public domain. I am your servant. So thank you for paying your taxes on time and in full. <laughs> Lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to just take Julia's and lump them together. She writes, so interesting do moles sound like that's just talking about that mechanical action uh yeah that so that's something that i failed to mention so when catania did his uh arenas he actually had geophones going on on those um the boxes and the frequency and amplitude is remarkably similar um you know you can't exactly hear a mole above ground when you're when they're digging but apparently it's it's quite a similar uh set of vibrations and she adds uh are there any carnivorous or predatory earthworms yes there are um there is agastrodrillus vermivorus in africa uh, it eats other earthworms it finds their burrows crawls down and then engulfs them uh, 
not sure if there are any others that are known. There's a couple of the relatives of earthworms in, in the aquatic um, annelids that uh, fresh water in, the, in North America that do eat other aquatic worms. But uh, the one in Africa is the best document. Very good. Brandon actually, uh, uh, you know, it resonates the similar question about introducing earthworms to his pile. We've already answered that. Don't do that. Uh, let the earthworms find the pile that, uh, you know, the earthworms that are actually present in your yard already. Um, and Promelia writes, uh, she is in favor of your beard. So I guess it's time for me to grow out mine too. Uh, Meisenberg writes, I have uh, earth, uh, earthworm con uh, consumers benefited from the introduction of non-native earthworms, example, American robins. Oh, so she's actually talking about birds. Have they benefited from uh, the introduction of these non-native earthworms? What is any, any uh, input on that? So it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, I, there's been a lot of work on salamanders and the the problem, uh, at least I'm thinking specifically of, of a you know, one of those epigeic uh, earthworms. The problem is that it eats up that their habitat. And so even though some of those salamanders might be predators and might be able to eat them, uh, they it's kind of offset. Uh, they also, they're somewhat unpalatable too. Uh, relative to some of the native fauna that they, they might be eating. Well, I would say um, that undoubtedly there are some bird species that have benefited. The robin's a great example. Um, you know, I, I read somewhere recently that the robin is among the top five most abundant birds on the continent. And it's because they eat worms, right? And we and humans have done a really good job of spreading new food. It's like a, a all-you-can-eat buffet for robins uh, in most suburban areas, right? And another species that comes to mind is the woodcock, American woodcock, which is kind of a um, obligate vermivore. And it's a real to me. This is a really interesting puzzle. And if I ever get the time and money to study it, I will. But um, you know, I think that the introduction of European earthworms into the maritime provinces of Canada effectively expanded the range of woodcock into that part of the continent um, because there previously were no worms there. And so um, I think that that's a really interesting system that is worthy of study. Very interesting indeed. Uh, man, we're going down the rabbit hole on this one. Yeah, it's easy to do. <laughs> the worm burrow, going down the worm burrow. That's right. Uh, Julietta writes, are there any earthworms here in North America that would eat roots or damage roots? Probably not. Um, I, this was, relates to some work that I was involved with in Kansas. We All of us, all three of us, by the way, were at Kansas State University at one point or another. Um, it turns out that plant roots aren't very good food. They're, they're kind of high carbon, low nitrogen. And so most plant or most soil dwelling invertebrates that eat organic matter uh, a root isn't that great unless it's something that's like piercing and sucking roots. So earthworms will do better grazing, I think, on the um, the microbial hotspot around a plant root. They may be better uh, suited to eating from that kind of soil rather than just the, the root itself. So speculation, a good question. Well, you got fan mail. I thought I, I, I had a feeling that you were speaking to the right cohort here. So you're right. Uh, never realized how much there was to know about earthworms. Thank you. Uh, Leah writes the same thing. Thank you for all the great information. Um, and Permelia writes helpful info. Thank you. Uh, Brandon writes, I work with garden beds. So I assume he's in uh, this type of industry. Uh, that have large clumps of organic matter in the soil. 
as well as a lot of leaf litter. I want to get a lot of that broken down into the soil. Are buying worms a good idea? So if this is kind of the same answer then. You build it, they will come. Okay, yeah, you guys are nodding. So yes, all right. Um, all right, and then Sheila writes, since birds like worms, why don't they eat them off the pavement when they crawl out of the grass onto the pavement? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. Maybe the, the birds have a more sporting mentality. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I think the answer is is that they do, but you can only eat so many worms before you've had enough. <laughs> All that's done. The early bird gets the worm and then takes a nap. Yeah, well, we're just getting up, and the early birds are staggering off to their their perch. That's my working hypothesis. <laughs> that's the same here. Nope. That, that kind of reminds me of one of my favorite uh, how to get more worms into the backyard uh, methods is get out there in the early morning after a heavy overnight rain in the spring and gather them up fast. You've got to get out there early before any sunlight hits them. Otherwise, they will not be happy worms. And uh, so that, you know, that's a way of sort of gathering up what's in your immediate area already rather than trying to get something else. Yeah, that, that was another thought that I had for a couple of these questions. If you're in an urban area, the, uh, the worms are probably there already. I don't think that means you should bring more right. in, but they may be present and you may be able to get them to move locally where you want them to without uh, buying more. All right, guys, I think uh, if there are any other questions, we will wrap it up. I'm sorry I lost internet there very briefly. Uh, but I want to thank the doctors again for their time and uh, just enlightening us on a very, very niche topic, especially for people like us, uh, and really highlighting uh, how incredibly complicated and um, diverse uh, our ecosystems really are. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, at this point, I would like to conclude the uh, program for tonight. So thank you so much again, everyone, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Oh.